It was sixty years ago this night, a dark and cold night, where I was in Scotland, outside in the street playing football with my friends, as was my wont. My late father, on his way out to a darts match for his workplace, the National Cash Register Company in Dundee, but based in Dayton, Ohio, came out and told me that the president had been killed. I openly wept and had immediately to go indoors. For everyone of my ethno-religious background, President Kennedy was something special. His picture adorned our walls. My party piece at the age of nine was a recitation of his inaugural address from the first day of his presidency. It was heartbreaking for many reasons. I had fallen in love with the very idea of Camelot, the very idea of Jack Kennedy and Jacqueline and their beautiful children and their handsome brothers and the set in which they moved. Everything seemed like a wisp of glory. Decades went by when the shine came off Camelot. The halo of President Jack Kennedy dimmed, but it never died. Something apart from Kennedy died that day in 1963. America died. The idea of America died, for people of my generation at least. We had high hopes of Jack Kennedy, some of which were dashed. But we believed, and I still believe, that he was the greatest of all American presidents, and that his second term would have significantly changed the order of things in America and in the world. We were excited by his promise to shatter the CIA and scatter it to the four winds. We were encouraged by his refusal to allow the state of Israel to become a nuclear weapons power. We were enthralled by his obvious and indeed early efforts to bring about detente with the Soviet Union, with Nikita Khrushchev, then the leader of the USSR. We were thrilled that he had eschewed any repeat of the Bay of Pigs fiasco, the invasion of Cuba, determined by his predecessor, though conducted in the early days of his presidency, a fiasco which led to the shedding of much blood and would lead to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which placed the world on the precipice of nuclear destruction, a precipice from which we were walked back by the skill and by the determination and the negotiating diplomatic skills of President Kennedy and his Soviet counterpart Nikita Khrushchev. We believed that Jack Kennedy, with his brother Robert as the Attorney General, were doing everything they could to clean up the the nest of mobsters, of Cuban emigres, of human filth that infested the inner circles of Washington, D.C. then and again today. We believed that Jack Kennedy was a good man. He was not as good a man as we believed, but he was better than all of the others before and since. Jack Kennedy was snuffed out in his prime on the verge of what undoubtedly would have been a successful election and a second term, during which he might well have put many of these promises into action and into reality. He might well have been the man to tackle and destroy the Jim Crow apartheid system that even then existed, so that some of Kennedy's circle could not sleep in the same 
hotels, even when they had been performing on stage together. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin had to sleep in one hotel, Sammy Davis Jr. in another, in the era of President Jack Kennedy. He might well have avoided the Vietnam War, which killed millions of people. He certainly was strongly suspected by the military industrial complex and the intelligence security apparatus of having no stomach for the war in Southeast Asia. He may have then been succeeded for a third Kennedy term by Robert Kennedy, by then a senator for New York, who did, in fact, launch an almost certainly successful campaign for the Democratic nomination in 1968, but was himself murdered. All this blood, all this hatred, all this gore at the first Irish Catholic president of the United States, all of it pierced into my consciousness, into my heart. And as I grew older, I became one of the many tens, maybe hundreds of millions of people who studied closely uh, the murder of first President Kennedy, then Senator Robert Kennedy, and concluded, overwhelmingly concluded, unshakably concluded, that the official story that we had been told about both murders could not possibly be true. Even before we saw the Sabruder video, which makes plain as a pike staff that President Kennedy was shot, not from one direction, but from two, not from one lone deranged palooka up in a book repository in Dallas, Texas, if at all by that palooka. But his murder came from the front. His murder came from the front. It is now increasingly clear and obvious, conducted by his own state, the state of which he was the president. He did not shatter the CIA into a million pieces, but they shattered his head, his brain, into many pieces indeed. He did not get the opportunity to cut down to size the military industrial complex, the security apparatus they did for him before he could do for them. Several individuals of interest have emerged over the decades as to who might have been in charge of the conspiracy to kill the president. Alan Dulles is definitely suspect number one, dismissed by Kennedy as head of the CIA after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, and even Kennedy's successor, then vice president, later president, Lyndon Johnson himself. We'll be talking to a considerable expert on these matters later in the show. Let me turn uh, to the mass murder in Gaza. There is a frenzy of violent thunderstorms of bombs, rockets, missiles, shot and shell raining down this evening on the prisoners in the world's largest prison camp, in the words of now Foreign Secretary, then Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron. All of it in advance of a four-day ceasefire, which will begin in the early hours. This ceasefire, we were told, was not the right thing to call for, People lost their jobs for demanding a ceasefire. Members of parliament, government ministers in other European countries were fired from their positions for calling for a ceasefire. 
the so-called mainstream media denounced everyone who demanded a ceasefire now as some kind of stooge or tool of Hamas. We were told that such a ceasefire could only imperil Israelis and Israel's security. We were told that such a ceasefire was non-viable, unacceptable, indeed was a propaganda crime against the people of the state of Israel. Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, repeatedly, over and over and over again, denounced the idea of a ceasefire, sent his shadow ministers out to smear everyone who demanded a ceasefire. And now there is a ceasefire because the mass murderer Benjamin Netanyahu himself has concluded one, leaving all of these collaborators with mass murder, not with egg, but with blood all over their faces, dripping from their hands, dripping from their mouths with every word that they spoke over the last 50 days or so. Words that are captured in celluloid forever and will endlessly be replayed, as will the voting figures in the British Parliament, in the House of Representatives, in the US Senate, where only one solitary senator, one out of 100, agreed to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Now that there is a ceasefire, Washington is apparently anxious that this is bound to lead to an enhanced presence of journalists and cameras who will record the scenes of devastation, the Dresden, the Hiroshima that has been visited on that prison camp from which no one could escape. How telling. Biden's not worried about the genocide. He's worried about cameras capturing the genocide during these four days. The deal was brokered by tiny Qatar and mighty Egypt. And we must be grateful to both for the work that they have done, showing that diplomacy can bring results. The deal is not complicated any more than the Gaza and the Palestinian story is remotely complicated. It's not nuanced. It is very clear, as clear as a pike staff. The truth is that 50 Israeli women and children hostages will be exchanged for 150 Palestinian women and children hostages. Although the BBC puts it that 50 hostages women and children will be released in exchange for 150 Palestinian women and children prisoners. Examine that. How can a child be a prisoner? Why are there 150 women and children prisoners in the Israeli dungeons? They were all seized by Israel in the wake of October 7. Why are they not hostages just as much as the 50 Israeli women and children that are to be released? But it's a welcome step. Nobody should be taken hostage, still less women and children, an act which is forbidden in all religion and in all law. It's a welcome step. But what about the rest of the hostages on both sides? Are they going to be killed 
in a new wave of genocidal bombing after the four days has elapsed? Are the Israeli prisoners under the ground, presumably, going to die there? Or will this ceasefire have to be extended? Will negotiations have to be entered into and prolonged? Any sensible person begs, pleads for that outcome. How unconscionable would it be to allow the Palestinian children something to drink and something to eat and a plaster to put over their wounds only to murder them at the end of a four-day ceasefire. The truth is, as China's leader and Russia's leader have both said today, there must be immediate, rapid conclusions to a political solution 30 years overdue since the signing of the Oslo Accords. I don't know how the Oslo Agreement could possibly now be put into practice. Now that almost all of the land that was supposed to go to the new Palestinian state is covered with multi-billion dollar so-called settlements in reality, towns and cities. But if the leaders of the world can produce this two-state solution, let them do so now. For nothing less than that, nothing less than that, could possibly avoid a repetition of the slaughter, the nightmarish slaughter that keeps any normal human being awake at night, forces any normal human being to turn away from the screen as they see the mothers and fathers burying their little children, the men carrying their wives and children dead and broken from the rubble. Any normal human being wants that ceasefire to be extended and a rapid, transformative political process immediately to bring about a political solution that may last. If you are still supporting what Netanyahu himself has paused, you are a psychopath. You should not be walking among us. And every day we now see more and more evidence of the fact that Zionism has become a kind of mental illness and its adherents, for their own sake, for all of our sakes, must shake themselves free of it and begin to repent and atone for the crimes that have been committed in its name. If only for their own mental health, they must examine the conscience that normal human beings have and see how ugly, how crazed, how ugly that which they have been supporting. There was once a fleeting wisp of glory. It was called Camelot. Let's pray that it can return to the world someday. It's the mother of all talk shows.